For AZPM, I'm Mark McLemore, and this is Arizona Spotlight. Coming up, what is artivism? Adiba Nelson talks with Dr. Pamela Mays McDonald, a guest lecturer for the UA College of Humanities Black History Month series. How did Las Vegas transform from a dusty watering hole to the entertainment capital of the world? I'll talk with Richard Zoglin, the author of Elvis in Vegas. And Penn and Teller are returning to perform at the Fox Tucson Theater. I'll interview one of them, but which one? Those stories are next on Arizona Spotlight. Dr. Pamela Mays McDonald is a former Fine Arts Museum's director and community organizer. She's an expert in evaluating linguistic, demographic, and psychographic data, which are all part of the concept of artivism. Her personal motto is, Yesterday's histories unravel today's mysteries. McDonald arrives in Tucson next week as a guest of the UA College of Humanities to give a talk entitled Social Artivism, Black Panther Culture from Oakland to the World. Here now is Adiba Nelson with the interview. So I'm super excited to be chatting with you today because I understand that you are going to be here at the University of Arizona at the end of February giving a talk called Social Artivism, Black Panther Culture from Oakland to the World. Yes, I'll be talking about something called artivism, which is a new phrase for a lot of people. It's a new phrase for me. Can you help me understand that? The artivist uses their artistic talents to fight and struggle against injustice and oppression by any medium necessary. The artivist merges commitment to freedom and justice with the pen, the lens, the brush, the voice, the body, and the imagination. The artivist knows that to make an observation is to have an obligation. That quote is actually from M.K. Asante. And you're relating social artivism to Black Panther culture. Well, what I'm doing is I'm using the city of Oakland, California, as a case study in social artivism. It's a characteristic of the area based upon not only its geography, but its history. Oakland, California is the first place of a lot of movements that end up moving across America, and then they go all the way out to the world. And another feature is that in the census, more people in Oakland listed artists as their profession on the census than any place else in America. So it has this high percentage of people that are practicing some form of art, be it music, poetry, writing, whatever kind of art, not just visual art or painting, but everything. Mm -hmm. It's a whole lifestyle. University of California at Berkeley is right there. Mm -hmm. So it's a part of that community. So that there's a very progressive lean to it, but it's also got an activism side of it. People getting out in the streets and protesting protesting issues that they believe in, a lot of people see the Black Panther Party as what they saw on TV, you mm-hmm. know, and it's some kind of gun-toting, militant, violent guys. But that's not how it started in Oakland. You know, these movements start in Oakland, but then they go outside and they change according to the mores and the values of the place that they're at. So the same thing is true with Black Lives Matter, which also started in Oakland, which is seen very poorly now as a BLM, which is a way of flattening the whole idea. But It's seen as this violent mob robbing, but that's not the way it started in Oakland at all. The reason behind the Black Panther culture, it's a culture. It wasn't just a a political philosophy, and I'm not going to be talking about the political philosophy or representing politics in any way. I'm going to be talking about the creative side of what was done and what's been done and how that has lingered throughout the world. Would you be able to offer some examples of where people can look and see as social artivism today that has influence of Black Panther culture? Right now, the Oakland Museum has an exhibition called Black Power. They've had an exhibition about Angela Davis, her whole, the whole aesthetic of Angela Davis. I'm talking about the Afros. Mm-hmm. The idea of the Afro comes out of the Black Panther Party, but yet everybody started wearing Afro hairstyles. So The aesthetic spreads, and we can look at Angela Davis's afro. She became a fashion icon in terms of that hairdo, Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. it just spread so much. One of the other things I'm going to talk about is the youth that are raised in Oakland. 
kids that are raised in San Francisco and Oakland, when they grow up, they carry that with them wherever they go. So right now, I know it's real popular, the Wakanda Forever film. Um, it's directed by a young man who is from Oakland. Right. Ryan Coogler. Ryan Coogler was upset by what happened to Oscar Grant in Oakland, which was really the basis for Black Lives Matter. But there are visual images that I can show between images of the Black Panther set and images of Ryan Coogler's childhood iconography of the Black Panther Party. And I'm talking about aesthetics. You mentioned something earlier that I really wanted to touch on. You said something in regards to Black Panther culture as opposed to Black Panther politics. And I think most people, when they think of the Black Panther Party, they only think of the politics side of it. Really quickly, can you help our listeners understand the culture side of the Black Panther Party? I'm talking about music. You have James Brown singing, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. You have a certain kind of... um, poetry that started coming out with poets reading with the music in the background. And and you have literature like Toni Morrison and you have Nikki Giovanni. You have all these different famous artists being inspired by the creativity that's coming out of this movement. They had a newspaper, the Black Panther newspaper. And if anyone is interested in looking something up, look up Amory Douglas, E-M-O-R-Y-D-O-U-G-L-A-S. He was the Minister of Information for the Black Panther Party, but he was an artist. And he drew all these cartoons for their newspaper, which had 300,000 circulation. Why did he draw those cartoons? Well, because the Panthers realized that they felt the community they were trying to reach, the very poorest and underserved people, were not readers. So to get their message across, they decided to use these cultural aspects. They decided to use Images that didn't need to be read to understand. You could just look at the image. You didn't need to read the whole story. Music to attract the young teenagers, you know, funky, cool rock music that would attract (laughs) the teenagers to come hear it on a street corner. Fashion, the black leather jackets. In 2016, Beyonce did the Super Bowl halftime show. And on that show, she introduced her song, Formation, Mm -hmm. which is directly influenced by what the Black Panther kids were doing. And so her dancers were on stage actually dancing in formation. People should know the Black Panther Party really was a lot of women. Women were the ones who did all the work. We know about men, and we, we know their names, Huey Newton, Bobby Seale. But the women, like uh, Elaine Brown, who became the head of the Panther Party, the women were really a part of it. And I want to make that thread to Black Lives Matter, which is directly done by the children of the Black Panther Party. And that is a woman-led movement. Can you tell me what artists of today you would typically see the Black Panther culture influence in? Well, there's a woman by the name of Fabiana Rodriguez, who is an immigrant that was raised in Oakland. Her parents came from, I think it was Chile. Because of that, they had also come as refugees, much like the African-Americans in Oakland, who came out in the Great Migration in the 40s, were all refugees from authoritarian and domestic terrorism in the South. So were the immigrants that came from, let's say, some of these South American countries where they overthrew dictators and people had to flee. So her parents fled. She lived in Oakland. They grew up in Oakland. And she was really inspired by the Black Panthers as a kid. And she just received an $11 million donation from Mackenzie Scott. You know who she is? Yes. Yes, I do. Well, I was just doing some research on Jean Michel Basquiat. Mm-hmm. People know about his work. I mean, his paintings sold for the most of any painting in the history of paintings several hundred million dollars, one painting. And this guy only lived until he was 27. He's one of the ones that died early. Right. But his paintings, if people know how to look at them, they're all black history, every single one of them. And he was so knowledgeable. He looks like a primitive artist. But when you, when you look with artistic eyes, which I'll be showing some ways to read his art during my presentation, you're going to see black power kinds of images, or mostly black history. But there was an exhibition at the Guggenheim Museum in New York, right on the cusp of the pandemic, uh, about a painting that he once did called Defacement. There was a young black man who was shot or was killed by police in New York City, and all the downtown artists knew him. He had been a graffiti guy. I think he was graffitiing, and somehow the cops shot him dead. And it really upset people, people like Keith Haring and Andy Warhol and Madonna doing original works of art and hosting fundraisers to raise money to help bury the guy. But Basquiat's painting Defacement 
is one of his most famous ones. And I'll be showing a couple of his paintings that depict the same kind of energy. The Black Panther Party started in 1966 after a young man was killed by police. If you look at a lot of the radical movements of African Americans going back, 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 you will see, as a historian, they were reactions to some innocent person being killed. Every time uh, somebody gets lynched or somebody gets shot or lynched in another way, let's say have someone stick their knee on their neck for eight and a half minutes. It could be a rope, but it's not a rope in the sense. So lynching is a wider category. But this has been going on for so long. And you find that this radicalization happens. People get comfortable. They try to start their lives. And then there's another killing. So there's a multi-generational, almost you could say genetic, PTSD that gets set in motion. And so this is why you see such anger, such response. So many people coming out. It's because it keeps happening over and over again. And whoever does the killing never gets convicted or even tried half the time. So it's the it's not just the killing. It's the fact that no one ever has to serve time for it. Adiba Nelson interviewed Dr. Pamela Mays McDonald. The University of Arizona College of Humanities presents McDonald's lecture, Social Artivism, Black Panther Culture from Oakland to the World, It's next Tuesday, February 28th at 6 p.m. at the U of A Poetry Center, and the event is free. Even here in the 21st century, the legacy of Elvis Presley still looms larger than life. A new book examines the creation of that legend. It's called Elvis in Vegas, How the King Reinvented the Vegas Show. It was written and researched by Richard Zoglin, a veteran journalist, Time Magazine television critic, and theater editor. Zoglin is visiting Tucson next week as a guest of the local Brandeis National Committee, and that gave me a chance to speak with him about the book. I've always been fascinated with Vegas. First went there on a family trip. I grew up in Kansas City. We drove out to California and stopped in Las Vegas along the way. I was 16 years old. We saw Johnny Carson on stage in Vegas, so that was my first memory. And it had a real glamour. Uh, the town and the, the hotels and the casinos, which I couldn't get into because I, I wasn't old enough. But, uh, you know, I really was fascinated with the place. And I went back a few times over the years. But I never had read a, a really good entertainment history of Las Vegas. Um, the, the whole concept of the Las Vegas show, which we all instinctively know w- what a Vegas show is like, but, but how did it start and how did it evolve over the years and what were the key sort of turning points, that's what I wanted to kind of explore. The Elvis aspect actually came as I was researching the book, and I, I knew about Elvis's big 1969 comeback show, but what I didn't know, and most people don't know, is that he first played there in 1956 when he was first coming up. The idea of Elvis doing a Vegas show in 1956 was is, was kind of weird, and, and he actually didn't do very well. But uh, he kept a connection with the town and it sort of uh, built toward his, his big comeback show in 1969. Your book often feels a little bit like you're going club hopping on the Strip because you you stop in at the Sands and then you go to the International. Yeah. I really wanted to just really tell the history of Vegas uh, that led up to Elvis's 1969 show, which I think was the most important show in Vegas history. But before that, Vegas was a, a different kind of place, and the uh, the big hotels, the classic hotels, were sort of built in the late 40s, early 50s. The heyday years of the, the nightclub years of Vegas were the 50s and 60s. Frank Sinatra and the Rat Pack and uh, that whole sort of nightclub era that we think of as classic Vegas. So I I really wanted to get into that era and and kind of explore what made up that era and what the high points were and uh, the lounge shows and the the Folie Bergere and the Lido de Paris, the big sort of girly shows that we, we knew Vegas for in those years. So yeah, there was a whole range of entertainment at that time. I didn't go to Vegas for the first time until the 1990s, uh, late 90s even. And already I noticed that the music in the buffets and, you know, everywhere was 80s, you know, like retro 80s, like Gary Newman, Smiths, you know, things like that. And that um, that was a little disheartening to me because I expected to hear Steve Lawrence and Edie Gourmet and I expected to hear Louis Prima and... 
And instead, it was the stuff I grew up on. And I thought, oh, okay, so Vegas isn't stupid. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> Vegas went through a lot of changes, um, especially, you know, in the 60s when the, the counterculture years, the uh, when rock music became the thing. And then Vegas, which had been kind of identified with Sinatra and the Rat Pack, and they were sort of the hippest guys in show business back in the early 60s. By the late 60s, they were not cool anymore. And Vegas was uh, kind of trying to figure out what it was going to be because it wasn't getting the younger generation. And by the 70s and 80s, I think it was kind of really wandering, uh, figuring out where it was going to go. And I think by the 80s and 90s, Vegas was really a little bit lost. I mean, a lot of the big name entertainers weren't coming there anymore, but they weren't really into the new generation of, you know, rock singers and stuff. Not until um, really Celine Dion in mm. the early 2000s and the new kind of Vegas residencies did the place start to attract sort of, you know, more big name entertainers again. Richard, in your book, you document a number of people who had personal connections to Elvis. And some of these aren't necessarily well known. And I mean, I'm talking about Barbara Streisand or Mac Davis. I found those parts of yep. the book really interesting where he would connect with another artist because Frank Sinatra wasn't necessarily that interested in uh, building friendships with younger artists, but Elvis always kind of seemed open to that. Yeah, well, Elvis, he loved uh, Vegas. He loved seeing the entertainment in Vegas, the lounge shows. Even before he, he was playing Vegas, he would just go there um, you know, on vacations just to, uh, you know, take a break from his filmmaking in the 60s. And he, he loved to go see, you know, the entertainment. And he was very generous to other performers. He really helped out other performers, older performers that he loved, like Fats Domino, the people who weren't big anymore, the people who influenced him. And then younger people, people like Mac Davis, who were just coming, who was a songwriter who um, who got involved with with Elvis, and he was uh, he was a generous entertainer, and he was very well liked. As I was doing my research on on the book, despite all the problems that we know Elvis had in his later years, the drug problems and everything, people liked him. He was genuine. He was interested in other entertainers, and so I thought that was a really uh, wonderful quality, and and you know, nice to hear. The revelation that he was offered the Chris Christopherson role in Barbara Streisand's version of A Star is Born was really interesting to me, by the way. Yeah, that was surprising to me, too. That was by the mid-'70s when he was really starting to go downhill, frankly. He was getting bored with Vegas. He was looking for other things to do. And suddenly um, he did apparently get this offer um, to star with and in, uh, in A Star is Born. I mean, what an interesting choice. I'm not sure if Elvis at that point had the acting chops to do it. Uh, hmm. And maybe that's why the colonel decided he basically made the deal so difficult that uh, they basically withdrew the offer. They went elsewhere. Um, I'm not sure if Elvis could have done that role, but it was certainly an interesting idea. I, I tell you, I choose to be optimistic and <laughs> think that that could have been his King Lear, you know. Um, wow. The album cover was always seemed like it was always on top of my mom's album stack growing up. And so uh, the Star is Born yeah. uh, album cover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I can easily envision it with Elvis and stuff. Yeah. Christopherson. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you mentioned the Beatles, and, and obviously the rise of the British invasion had a big impact on the American music scene and helped to demote Elvis at that time. I, I found a, a note near the end of your book really interesting that uh, although the Cirque du Soleil Beatles tribute called Love, as far as I know, has been a big success and, and is perhaps still even running, whereas the Elvis Cirque du Soleil show, Viva Elvis, closed within two years. And and it's like, yeah. you know, and those Beatles, what a bunch of bullies, you know, they're still pushing Elvis Aaron around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. The Beatles, Elvis, you know, I think he admired the Beatles, but I think he was a little jealous of the popularity. They were the big thing in the mid 60s. The Beatles really looked up to Elvis, respected Elvis. And once when they were in the U.S. doing one of their U.S. tours, they they actually wanted to meet Elvis, and they, in L.A., they went to Elvis's house, and there was a, they got together, and it was, it was pleasant, but 
I think Elvis uh, still felt bad that he, he had kind of been left behind by the rock world. So, you know, Cirque du Soleil was interesting. I'm not sure why. I never saw the Elvis show, the Cirque du Soleil Elvis show. It may just happen something to do with the show itself. I thought the, their Beatles show, Love, was, was, is really good. Um, but uh, Vegas has plenty of other ways to celebrate Elvis. Uh, the Elvis impersonators are still all around. <laughs> There's Elvis tribute shows. And so maybe they feel that they were doing their bit for Elvis and they didn't need Cirque du Soleil to help out. <laughs> My guest was journalist Richard Zoglin, the author of Elvis in Vegas, How the King Reinvented the Las Vegas Show. He'll be appearing during a luncheon that begins at 9.30 a.m. on Thursday, March 2nd at the Skyline Country Club. Zoglin will be joined by acclaimed fellow authors Sarah Penner, Stephen Saltonstall, and Jennifer Robson, all guests of the Tucson chapter of the Brandeis National Committee. Proceeds from the event will benefit Sustaining the Mind, a Brandeis National Committee fund supporting a Brandeis University research program that combats neurodegenerative diseases including ALS, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's. You can find information about tickets and streaming options on the Arizona Spotlight page at azpm.org. For as long as I can remember, I've loved seeing magic being performed. But even as I approached my teenage years, I was getting kind of sick of how stagey and, well, phony most of the magic on TV had become. Luckily, a completely unpredictable duo arrived on the scene called Penn and Teller. These bad boys of magic caused a stir and challenged their colleagues to start really surprising their audiences and put the illusion of danger back into their rabbit and hat routines. Penn is the tall, loud one, a master juggler and con man elite. Teller is the less tall, silent one, a daredevil and sleight-of-hand champion who never loses his cool. For the last 45 years, they've been evolving the talents and sharpening the skills that they're bringing to the Fox Tucson Theater on Wednesday, March 1st. So, I got my second chance in life to talk with Teller, who is at his home in Las Vegas, and I hung on his every word. I'm very excited about all the new stuff that we are constantly working on, and that is something that invigorates me everlastingly. I, I, yesterday afternoon, I met Penn in a cafe, and we went over several new ideas, and it's kind of what I live for, you know? <laughs> I think I can draw an analogy. When you play in a band, um, that's a lot of fun, but the most exciting thing is the new song. Whatever the new song you're working on is, is the draw. You know, for me, there is this combination of the new stuff and the old stuff, which both have an attraction. Um, the, the new stuff is, you know, is the latest adventure. The old stuff is the stuff that you have a chance to get better and better at with every show. Even if you've done the same particular piece for 30 years, it's very possible that this or that performance will suddenly inspire you to go, oh, you know, I never thought of that touch. And I, I guess there's part of the old vaudevillian in me. In the, you know, those those people would sometimes have a 20 minute act that they did their whole lives, and they achieved a degree of perfection that we just don't see anywhere. You know, you just you can't see that level of proficiency in, um, in magic or juggling or any of those things. There was a juggler named Bobby May whom Penn and I met when he was very very old, and Bobby May showed us film of his act. And at the end of his ball juggling routine, he was juggling like seven balls. And all of a sudden, he lost control of the balls, or so you thought. He lost control of the balls. They were bouncing all over the stage. And then he took his top hat off. And with almost no movement on the part of his body, he reached out and swept it through the air, caught six of the balls, did a forward roll, caught the last of the balls on, his, on the back of his neck, and popped that into the hat. <laughs> uh, that's that's not something you achieve overnight. It takes a lifetime to do. And so, you know, when when we when we come to any given place, we, we always try for a nice combination of things that are old and really polished and rich, and things that are new and a little more daring. How long have you and Penn been performing in Vegas? And do do you ever use the word residency? 
Um, some people use the word residency. It's a fine word. We, we've been at the Rio All Suites Hotel for about 20 years. We've been in Vegas for a little little over 30 years. We celebrated the 30th anniversary in Vegas about a week and a half ago. My goodness. It was, it was odd for us because, you know, wh- what do we come from? I come from Philadelphia. Penn comes from Massachusetts. And, you know, we got this sort of reputation as this, uh, you know, very hip New York off-Broadway act. And when we were first invited to play at a Vegas casino, basically what we said was, play for those Philistines? Good heavens, no. (laughs) (laughs) But as it turns out, the same people who go to Broadway also go to casinos. So we, uh, we, we became very happy to know that there's a sort of universal audience. Here's a question I've always wanted to ask a magician, and I don't think I ever have. Oh, good. On any given day, tell her, how many prepared bits of business might you carry with you? Do you do that? Do you carry things in your pockets that you can use to produce a trick if you're required? Not invariably. When I was in high school, I thought that doing magic would enhance my social life. And when you think about it, when you're trying to enhance your social life in high school, what you want to do is to build trust with some other person. And perhaps the least successful way of building trust with another person is to deliberately deceive them. And, and so I, I, I sort of lost some, something of the joy of universally being prepared to do a magic trick. Now, the fact is, there's one trick that I am always prepared to do if I can borrow a coin from somebody. So I was in, where was I? I was in Sydney, Australia, in one of those very high locations where you can look out over the city and a mature woman came up to me and said, oh, I love your work. I love your work. Could you do a trick for me? And I went, okay. And I borrowed a, some kind of coin from her. And I did that coin trick for her and gave the, gave the coin back to her covered with spit, as it is at the end of the trick. <laughs> so I, yeah, I'm, I'm always prepared to do that one coin trick. There are, if I'm going to some sort of special occasion where I think someone might want to see a piece of very beautiful magic, I might go subtly prepared, not to look like I'm prepared. I mean, I'm not carrying a silver ball on a stand with a with a buzz saw. Uh, the props that I'm using look like part of my my wardrobe. Then I will just wait because if nobody asks for something, believe me, I'm not going to do it. But if somebody sort of asks rather insistently, I'll go. Well, you know, I could do this, and I walk into any given place and see if. Some of the other props I might need present themselves. There's something that I do with a flower close up like that. I remember walking into Barbara Streisand's dressing room and thinking that she'd enjoy a trick, but you know what? There isn't a suitable flower here. Oh, well, and didn't do the trick. The point you made about when you want to amaze people with your tricks, but they know you're probably coming up to them to play a trick. It's just like if you tell people jokes a lot, then anything you say begins to sound like the setup for a joke, even when it might be tragically true. <laughs> so so that really, <laughs> the logic of what you said made a huge amount of sense to me and makes me understand why it's probably not, like you said, the way to you know, win friends and influence people. So I like that. Some people do it. I mean, truly, I, I know some, some magicians who uh, use it as a social lubricant but they've got the, the exact right style that then makes it makes it work just fine. I just never I was never able to find that as a as a high schooler. And so the idea of close up magic didn't interest me. And the idea of doing magic in the real world seems like a fundamentally different idea from the idea of doing magic in the theater. In the, in the theater, you have the proscenium to say everything we're doing here is a trick. So. If you do something that looks like mind reading, you have a little danger of the person misconstruing it as some sort of actual supernatural event. I like the protection that having a proscenium gives you from from people misconstruing what you're doing. Because of your highly distinctive stage presence and the character that you have created for yourself and the character that Penn has also created for his self, Do you think that you sometimes in daily life maybe benefit from a certain kind of sympathy or compassion that people might feel for you that's different than, say, the way they might feel about Penn? I kind of generally know what you mean, but if you know Penn, if you meet Penn in person, what you find is that the brashness 
that he is capable of exuding on stage uh, is really no part of his real personality. <laughs> that his, his real personality is sort of um, a guy who always aspired to be a French existential writer who was raised by two extremely kind and sweet New England parents who took work very seriously and who loves good jokes. I mean, so he's he's a he's a very jolly companion in real life. I, but I know what you mean I, we, because we've done some things in which um, I've been the uh, not exactly the victim, but but in which I've played the the underdog, mm-hmm. a Laurel and Hardy j- aesthetic. The underdog that very often triumphs. That was the rarely heard voice of one of the most recognizable entertainers in the world, the magician known only as Teller. He and his best friend, Penn Jillette, will take the stage at the Fox Tucson Theater on Wednesday, March 1st, and there's no telling if they're ever going to decide to give it back. Thank you for listening to Arizona Spotlight. This show is a production of AZPM. The music is by Calexico. The production engineer is Jim Blackwood. The assistant producer is Leah Britton. I'm producer and host Mark McLemore. Arizona Public Media's original programming is made possible in part by the Community Service Grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.